The Banker by Jim Dodge. His smile is like a cold toilet seat. He shakes my hand as if he found it floating two weeks dead in a slough. I tell him I need money. Tons of it. I want to buy a new Lamborghini, load it with absinthe and opium, and hit the trail out of these rainy hills for a few years in Paris. I try to explain I'm at the point in my artistic development where I require a long period of opulent reflection. The banker rifles my wallet, examines my mouth, chuckles when I offer 20 Miltonic sonnets as security on the loan. Now he's shaking his head, my confidence, my hand, goodbye. Wait, I plead, I have debts and dreams my present cash flow can't possibly sustain. Sorry, he mumbles, nothing I can do, and staples some papers in a way that makes me feel he'd rather nail my tongue to an ant hill. I stare at him in disbelief, and under the righteous scathing of my gaze, the banker begins to change form. First he becomes a plate of cold french fries drenched in crankcase oil, then a black spot on a page of Genesis. Finally, a dung beetle rolling little balls of shit across a desk bigger than my kitchen. Yet even as I follow these morbid transformations, I never lose sight of his bloated face, the green-handled skin, shining like rotten meat. But then his other face is open to mine, father, lover, young man-child, our shared human history folding us into one. And only that stops me from beating him senseless with a sock full of pennies. Welcome to the Poetry Oracle podcast, and thanks for listening. Today I decided that some humor was necessary with all the depth and seriousness of my previous posts, and while Jim Dodge's poem is funny, hilarious, one of my all-time favorites, it also has a certain depth and seriousness meandering under all that humor. For me, Dodge captures the essence of greed in this poem, control, and the shadow side of money and those who hoard it and control it. It reminds me of the days when I was trying to get financing for my business, a social mission which saved needless loss of lives and serious injuries, had a well-written business plan, and in the end proved to become a $5 million company. Yet I could get most bankers to not even get close to it as they turned me away. The answers were always the same. Not enough collateral, not a perfect credit score, not enough projected revenue to make it worth the bank's while, and my home as collateral was not even enough. And yet it seems that others seem to declare multiple bankruptcies, run companies into the ground right and left, and still obtain financing again and again. And they seem to be the ones with a lot of money to start, or at least the appearance of it, whether they were successful with it or not. A perfect example are illustrious leader, the great deal maker, heralded as a great businessman, when in fact he has never been successful as a businessman at all. Instead, a history of bankruptcies, failed operations, major tax dodging, and probable criminal actions. Yet, I bet he could walk in the bank today and get a $10 million loan when he is no more than what my graduate school professor used to call a chimpanzee in a business suit. In the end for me, I was finally able to secure a credit line of $50,000 and build it into this $5 million company, paid back the line of credit early, paid all my taxes, was profitable each and every year of my company's existence, and won City Business of the Year. And right at the brink of major growth and personal financial success, it was taken in a hostile takeover by a large multi-billion dollar company. I pictured similar green-handled skin bean counters in the corporate office deciding to squeeze Tim out, which would increase their profits by a total of maybe 0.01% 
of their total annual profit each year. They never offered a single cent to buy me out. They just took it. Yes, it was legal, but certainly not ethical. And while my bank accounts are mostly empty now, I do have one account that outperforms theirs every year, and they can never have the bank account of integrity, doing the right thing, not being a slave to money, but instead see it as energy, a means to get things accomplished in the world, perhaps make it just a little bit better place. My dad used to say that your arse is bare when you enter the world and it will be bare when you leave it. So in the end, we are renting everything, including money. And, it, and it, if it is just energy to allow one to do things in the world they want to accomplish, whether professionally or personally, then there is nothing wrong with earning the right to be paid what you are worth in pursuit of those efforts while maintaining one's integrity. And no matter how much or how little I have in this paper energy, in the end, it will not fit into my cremation urn with me anyway. Dodge also beautifully weaves in a stanza where he looks at the banker with human compassion and honors the humanness of us all, even the banker. And like many other things, the power of gold can be mesmerizing, addicting, and the old stories around the world tell of the dragons or other beasts or malformed men who hoard this gold. And it seems like many who have a great deal of money don't really seem all that happy as they work so hard to protect and hoard what they already have and try to make it grow even more. I also think of the American and perhaps worldwide belief that is inculcated into all of us as young adults. Work hard, save your money, make enough so you will have enough for retirement. And then when one is 65 or 70 years old, they can enjoy the money they have worked so hard for and saved for so long. That never seemed to make a lot of sense to me. By the time I am that age, I might be fairly tired, my body certainly aged, maybe even sick with some medical condition or limitation, and now I can enjoy my money? While we certainly need to have enough to live in our old age, this whole belief is set upon a premise that, at least in America and perhaps more and more worldwide, the old person must still fund themselves as Social Security certainly has not kept pace with the cost of living in America, and many of our old folks are left to minimal living at best. There was a time in cultures where the old were cared for by the community, never to have to worry again about money and paying the bills. They were honored, supported, protected, fed, and housed as the valuable elders they are, more important than any gold for they have the wisdom the culture needs to continue forward. And Dodge grabs hold of questioning this belief with ribald humor as he tries to secure a loan to live, at least for a while, a sort of hedonistic life while he still can. And by the way, hedonism originally was started by a student of Socrates, Aristippus, who advocated that one could seek to live a life of joy and pleasure and still maintain one's integrity. Interesting how the word's etymology has morphed into something completely different. But alas, that's for another time. So I guess consciously and unconsciously I've chosen a life lived as a student of Aristippus and perhaps a little Jim Dodge, where I seek opportunities of joy and pleasure in life while maintaining my integrity, even though it appears maybe that Mr. Dodge was attempting, in a trickster way, to obtain a loan to live a stint of joy and pleasure, perhaps without the intent of ever paying it back. And now I realize as I write this, if he did mean that in this poem, he would be doing nothing different than many of the greedy ones with no integrity who declare bankruptcies, cheat, avoid taxes, never paying back the loan, and then do it again and again and call themselves successful businessmen and women. And of course, the banker, who would never allow that kind of loan to Mr. Dodge, turns him away 
in a heartbeat anyway. 20 Miltonic sonnets will never be collateral for this bank. And yet Milton's sonnets live on, way beyond his lifetime, eternal even, perhaps, no matter what Milton's bank account looked like when he died. That, to me, seems a much better return on one's life investment, instead of those bankers and other false or nefarious business giants who pass away with millions in the bank, zero in their integrity account, and become a small black spot at best, in the pages of history. I hope you choose to seek your own joy and pleasure with whatever paper energy you may have while you still can enjoy it, maintaining your integrity. To that end, if I could, I would happily even give you a loan from the Bank of Hedonism, where your integrity is the only collateral. Blessings, Pleasure and joy to you until next time. About Jim Dodge. Jim Dodge, born in 1945, is an American novelist and poet whose works combine themes of folklore and fantasy set in a timeless present. A friend of Gary Snyder, he has published three novels, Pup, Not Fade Away, and Stone Junction, and a collection of poetry and prose, Rain on the River. He has had many jobs, including apple picker, carpet layer, teacher, professional gambler, shepherd, woodcutter, and environmental restorer. He received his Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing and Poetry from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop in 1969. He has been the director of the Creative Writing Program in the English Department at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California since 1995.